please join me in welcoming our three speakers. Following their presentation, uh, there will be a question and answer session. They've kindly agreed to answer some questions. And, uh, but first, we'll hear very brief uh, uh, discussions from each three of them, starting with Gert. It's a real pleasure to see the, the room so full, and it's a, a special pleasure to be with my very old friends, not in terms of age, but in terms of how far we go back. Um, I suppose those two things might be related. Um, I was asked to uh, say a little bit about how Qatar has responded um, and why to this crisis. But I think that's very hard to do without having some sense of what the causes are. I I'll simply give you some bullet points and then we can see, we'll see how Abdullah and my other friends um, react to those suggestions. I think the, the origins and the causes are in fact fundamental. The perceptions of, or the facts about and the perceptions of what the origins and the causes were, are fundamental to understanding Qatar's, the Qatar leadership's um, reaction to them. And I, I suggest there are really several levels. The first is the long-term level. Um, we all know, of course, that there's been all sorts of accusations and there's been a list of 13 demands and also all sorts of propaganda, including on, um, on television and in the newspapers and in conferences in London in recent, in recent days. Um, but really, I think fundamentally, the long-term um, cause is, or proximate cause, is a, a long-standing sense in Saudi Arabia and all, almost sections of the leadership in Saudi Arabia um, about Qatar's proper role. And that was very much as a, you might not strictly call it a vassal state, but certainly someone who would follow, not lead and not challenge Saudi's, Saudi Arabia's uh, leading role in, in, on, in the Arabian Peninsula and the Gulf region. And there's long been some irritation, as many of you will know, with Qatar's um, attempt since 1990s, in the mid-1990s, in fact, a little bit earlier than that, to escape from underneath the, uh, the, sh the Saudi shadow. Um, that has morphed into um, a stronger sense of, I would say, of Saudi, Saudi leadership or the part of the Saudi lead, uh, leading group that has now uh, got hold of power to get back to a position, get, get, put Qatar back into its, its box, essentially. Um, the current leadership is clearly no longer willing or was no longer willing to um, countenance little Qatar latecomer in terms of Gulf development, um, striding so, um, so confidently on the regional and international stage. So that's the broader background. So essentially what it was about is putting Qatar back, back in its box. And that, of course, has um, quite likely um, consequences for what sovereignty, what kind of sovereignty Qatar would be left with. Um, and that, of course, has informed Qatar's response. There's no way that Qatar will, the Qatar leadership, or indeed now the population, will countenance such a loss of sovereignty. Um, the second level were then the, the more proximate, the, the more immediate issues over the, the last decade or so. And that's, that's Qatar's um, adoption of a number of policies that, as part of its assertion of independence, clashed with the policy preferences of Saudi Arabia and also of a number of other states in the region, particularly Bahrain and um, the UAE. Although when I say the UAE, and we can talk about that later in a minute, um, you re we're really talking here about Abu Dhabi. And these policy issues center around the, a different attitude towards the role of political Islam in the wider region and um, relations with um, with a number of groups that don't fit the policy preferences of these other uh, regional players, and of course also with Iran. I've been following Qatari foreign policy for a long time, and I always thought it was, it was particularly pragmatic. It was flexible, it was hedging its bets. I never saw it as ideological, and I still don't. Um, but this, was, this went against uh, the grain of policy um, 
of the analysis of what is important for national security in these other countries and the policy preference that flew from it. So when that gets combined with this underlying sense that Qatar should really um, stay in its place, you can see where that leads. The third um, level was the Arab Spring, as we know, when these issues suddenly became much more potent um, in, in the perception of the leaderships in Abu Dhabi and Saudi Arabia in particular, and of course also Egypt and Bahrain. Um, we all know that the enabling factor of Trump then intervened, um, and finally, um, there was, I think, a fifth factor that one has to take into account that helps all of this um, become a consolidated new reality, which is the changing changes in the leadership in uh, Saudi Arabia and in Abu Dhabi. Um, so the Qatar leadership has perceived all of that and as a consequence was able to look at what the major threats were. There was one threat to sovereignty, potentially a political threat internally, although I would argue, and I think the Qatar leadership has, has realized that domestic political threat is virtually non-existent. There was potentially a military threat, but that was very quickly um, realized as in, um, unviable because of the position that the United States in particular had taken, but also a number of other international players. And then finally, there, is, there are the, so, the societal and the economic threats. Societal, the societal threat has, has been uh, one of the most uh, serious with families for the first in unprecedented way suddenly being cut off, populations, kinship groups being cut off from each other in ways that really hasn't ha ever happened before. And the economic side of things, that's very serious and we can, we can elaborate on that further in the discussion, but it's not something that is unsustainable. It, the Qatar leadership has, I think, rightly con concluded that while it's very expensive and painful, it can be sustained if the alternatives are the, the giving up in effect of one's uh, sovereignty and going back into the shadow of, um, of the Saudi big brother. So I think I'll leave it there. There's plenty more to, to um, elaborate on all of these points, but I'll see what my, my fellow analysts say. Perfect, thank you. Um, well, good evening, uh, everybody. Um, it's uh, always uh, great to see a full, uh, full hall. Uh, and uh, thank you, uh, Mehran, for this uh, kind invitation. Always a pleasure to be here. Um, like you, I was surprised, of course, of the, uh, of the crisis. No one did actually predict it, um, despite the fact that we actually work on the Gulf, study the Gulf region. And, um, and, and try to analyze what is going on, this has just gone beyond our uh, uh, comprehension that something like this is going to happen. And if anybody knows uh, the causes for this, um, you know, we can discuss it, but I, I think there are, it's multi-casual, and, uh, and as Gerd has uh, um, just mentioned, there are a number of reasons for it, and I totally agree with him, but I will also add a few more of my own, if I may. Um, I think we are talking here about um, the fact that the GCC states, despite the fact they are a 21st century state, they are essentially ruled as um, uh, basically um, what I would call um, Middle Ages. I know I'm gonna regret this sometime, uh, uh, but the way that we are ruled is by families that um, still have these feuds and conflicts between them. And you can't really continue in this century doing it the same way that you do. And Gerd had mentioned um, that um, Saudi Arabia intention of placing Qatar in the box and keeping it as a, a vessel, I totally agree with that. It's always been the case, even before 1996. Um, but since 1996 as, as well, this has accelerated 
uh, and we have seen what the Saudis are trying to do to the smaller Gulf states, that's trying to act beyond its size uh, in, in so many people's opinion. But the problem with having uh, a middle age uh, 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 kind of uh, uh, middle ages kind of uh, uh, leadership in the region is you expect anything to happen. And they are very erratic. There was crisis that came out of nowhere um, based on very fabricated uh, news, as you all know. But there was the other day they were almost talking to each other, or they did talk to each other, and we almost had a solution. And then next morning we wake up and there was no solution. So we're going to see and we're going to work with this erratic leadership, unfortunately, for a long time, because some of them are still young. And they're going to rule us for the next 40 to 50 years. And God help us in this region. If this is going to be the kind of leadership and this is the kind of policies that we're going to, uh, to have. So that is uh, uh, one way of I explaining this. It's, it really goes back to the mentality of the tribe. Uh, uh, a middle-aged tribe that hasn't really evolved with uh, the modernity that we have seen here. Modernity is only fabric that you see in terms of uh, the infrastructure, etc. But not when it comes to political system. Um, so that's one reason. The other reason I would say, um, and Gerd had uh, also uh, alluded to this, it's, we have a conflict, we have contradiction um, in, uh, in views of how the region is going to, developed, uh, to be developed and what's going to happen. Uh, we have a conflict in narrative, a narrative uh, between what Qatar sees and what the leadership in Qatar wants to see develop, including the Arab Spring, including the change, uh, etc. And another narrative that I want to see the status quo uh, as it is, and perhaps even go back before the status quo, uh, taking us to police states, whether that is going to be in Egypt or but some of the GCC states as well. And they don't want to see change. And they're going to blame anything, political Islam, modernity, uh, democracy, they don't want it. They just don't want change, and they want to continue ruling in the way they have been doing um, for so many years, taking us and keeping us in the Middle Age system. And that's not going to happen. That is what is going to create uh, resentment. That's going to create um, more people, uh, uh, terrorism, etc., cetera, uh, and radicalization. Uh, and I see the sign to end, but I'm going to say something about the GCC. I promise I would say that. This conflict actually goes against the whole principle of the GCC. The GCC is based on cooperation, integration between the member states. Uh, and it's based on uh, the fact that th these, these, the people here are the same people, the same tribes, uh, so, uh, societies are the same, and this is the their vision for integration and for common uh, objective and, and common future. What do we see here? The GCC is based on principle. It's a rule-based institution. Any decision at the GCC level that is, touches substantive matter, as the charter would say, uh, it has to be uh, decided by uh, unanimity, that all the GCC leaders have to decide. Anything on, uh, on less substantive matter, operational matters, it can be by majority. So that's one thing. The other thing, you have the GCC has entered into a number of agreements, whether it is security, whether it is in, uh, economic uh, cooperation and integration, custom union, common market. It means what? Uh, free flow of people, goods and services, and finance. And now this decision to boycott goes against the principle of the GCC. And it did not go to the Supreme Council to decide it on a majority basis. So what we're talking about here 
is a fundamental flaw in how the GCC is working. And are we going to have a GCC at the end of the day if people cannot trust the rules, the charter, the agreements that these leaders, the so-called leaders, uh, middle-aged uh, kind of leadership that we have here, are going to decide? How do the people, how do the countries believe in the GCC? What about the other Kuwait, for example? Uh, and what about Oman? And what about other countries? How would they believe on that, that, that these rules and these treaties are going to be respected? How about us, as citizens of the GCC, are going to believe in the GCC? This is fundamental flaw in the GCC. It really deals uh, a big blow to our future of integration and cooperation. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, then I'll uh, begin with uh, how it all started. I was here uh, for uh, 10 months sabbatical at the Arab Center in Doha. And um, I opted for this particular sabbatical in Doha because it is a very calm and quiet place. <laughs> and for, for eight months I mean, of my sabbatical, it was very calm. I mean, I'm not going to say almost boring, but I mean, very calm. So I told myself, uh, I mean, I, I did. I finished a book, and I worked on another book. And there was, so I did a lot of good things. I needed that sense of calmness until I uh, one day realized that we are in the middle of a crisis. The media um, in May, later May, and then suddenly I wake up on the 5th of June and there is boycott, no, and there is uh, closure of borders and no fly. I said, oh my God, now I can't even fly anymore. I mean, it's, it's, uh, uh, that, uh, and then, so I, I got a feeling similar to my feelings when uh, Iraq uh, threatened Kuwait, but not really on the 2nd. I mean, on the 2nd of August, they came. But on the 1st of August, I got the same feelings. It felt like war, just minutes before war. So I looked from the 10th uh, floor where I was and looked, I mean, are there any tanks in the streets or <laughs> any? I, honestly, I felt that the next, I mean, the logical was to see the tanks in the streets. And I didn't find them, said, oof, good. At least uh, you know, I can go to the Arab Center, but maybe they are there in disguise and I will be arrested and accused and I see some of my colleagues' names all over the place and on the terrorist list, so it's going to be tough. So I uh, kind of uh, was totally shocked and surprised because as long, I mean, as far as I know, Qatar and all the other GCC, they were fighting together in Yemen. And everybody was together on some sort of uh, a, a, a policy in Syria. That they together worked against Muammar al-Qazafi. That they together supported uh, 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 all kinds of uh, uh, the Iraqi system to fight ISIS. They were part of the war on terror. So, wow, I mean, how did this all happen? Uh, and then I remember that King, wasn't King Salman in Doha a few months ago? Oh my, what happened? I mean, in three, four months or, or five months. And wasn't uh, uh, the emir of Qatar in Riyadh? And they were all shaking hands and smiling. I mean, uh, what would this tell me about the region and about the way politics, I mean, this sudden shift overnight is, is uh, problematic. But it just happened. However, I relaxed when I heard that the Emir of Kuwait is starting a mediation immediately. So I said, at least somebody is standing outside of the conflict and is having a view on it that could bring about a solution. But I didn't really come, honestly, until I saw the Turkish parliament make a decision to send troops. I realized that such a situation is going to need such a balancing act. And that's when 
I relax. I, that's, I mean, usually I smile, but now for two days I wasn't smiling. <laughs> now I started to smile. I felt relaxed. I made some calls. I mean, I, 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 I was in a, in a good shape. I went back to my routine and exercise and everything. So you really had a, 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 big, a big change with this. But then I looked at what the Qatar was doing. They were managing the crisis well. Mm -hmm. I said, I mean, usually a crisis makes you manage a crisis with, with tension. I saw the Qataris come, collected. Their foreign minister was working very well. And, and there was no tension in the way they managed the crisis. They opened a route with Oman. They created a good connection with Iran on issues of trade and uh, ports. They managed to uh, work out relations with Europe. And then, so I said, that looks like, so what did the others expect? They expected that the Qatar will immediately come and capitulate and say, whatever you want. That's it. But that didn't happen. There was a big, major miscalculation in this entire approach of blockade and boycott that took place. And as a result of that, uh, Qatar was able to hold itself. And there is a balance of power. What we are entering, as it seems to me, is a, a I mean, we are now at the, I mean, to use Churchill's words, the end of the beginning and not the beginning of the end. And it's in this context where I see new axes in the region, new power structures. And uh, Qatar has a new birth in its own. It's liberated from certain contacts and relations. It could treat itself as an island in an ocean. It can build new strategies and structures and approaches. And yet, the blockade and the sanctions can slowly fall out of its own weight and out of its own irrationalism regarding at least human rights and travel and families and, and so many uh, things. So, uh, so it's a long one as I see it. And it does create new balances and new uh, relationships in the region that will fit this wider situation. So in a way, do I still believe there will be 2022? We're going to come to the games here. I think we're going to come to the games here. <laughs> My thanks to uh, all three of you uh, for uh, concise uh, but very insightful analyses. Before I open it up to the public for uh, questions, I wanted to ask a couple of questions. Uh, Gert, uh, how long can Qatar uh, hold out? Well, I suppose the implication of what I was trying to say earlier is that the leadership has to balance the cost and the pay, societal cost and economic cost, essentially, versus what the fundamentals of this, the long-term fundamentals of this conflict really are about. If it were only about a few small policy adjustments, perhaps about um, putting in place a number of um, measures that are in line with the agreement with the United States about counterterrorism counter and, and um, money flows, then that could be done, and in fact is being done. If it were about perhaps adjusting some of the ways in which the editorial line or the staffing of Al Jazeera Arabic, uh, some kind of adjustment that could perhaps be done. And so if it were about those things by, by themselves, one might see an adjustment. But because actually, as, as you see from the 13 conditions, they were not meant to be acceptable. They were clearly unrealistic. That wasn't what it was about. It was about this fundamental putting Qatar back in its box. Given that that's the fundamental uh, issue at stake, I think the leadership has rightly uh, decided, well, rightly, but that's, that's not me to, for me to judge, but has decided that you know, then it's worth sticking it out. And if you look at the resources that they can put against the various threats I, I briefly listed, militarily, of course, on their own, they can't stop an invasion. But they've got the lots of allies. It's not as if the base, the American base here, is going to, to stop a Saudi uh, incursion. But it's the whole political network, global, uh, global network with that, that, that comes with this. And a US interest, which are very genuine in this region and in Qatar, that that uh, can, be, can be put aside. Um, politically, I say domestically, I don't think 
uh, there is any serious opposition. There are, there's always been lots of different views about certain aspects of policy and so on. There's always grumbling. Some of it you see on social media, some of it you see in the print media, but it's never added up to a coherent opposition movement. Hence, the, the, the conference that just happened in London, 150 people turned up, of whom, what, two or three Qataris? Um, and most of them journalists. So then on the societal and the economic side, yes, there it's painful. But I think there the, the economic means are in place. Um, the banking sector is strong enough, it's, it's, it's properly um, sub, uh, financed. Um, alternative routes, as has already been suggested, are being put in place for international trade. Hamad Port has just been opened and will be fully functional in the next few months. So over time, a year hence, Qatar will be in a better position than now even to sustain this for the long term. Perfect, thank you. Abdullah, you talked about the uh, different narratives that are out there in the GCC. Um, who is winning the war of the narratives? Because one of the things we see is that now the conflict has moved on to virtual space in social media, but also in satellite television. And there are all sorts of different news that is out there. So as far as the Arab street is concerned, out there, outside of the GCC, but also in the streets of different places, who's winning the narrative war? Yep. Um, I will also add to what uh, my colleague uh, and good friend, old friend, uh, had just mentioned. I think the cost of this conflict to Qatar is, you know, what is the cost of losing sovereignty? And if, you know, if you have a, if you can attach a cost to losing sovereignty, then you can imagine how Qatar would succumb to this pressure. And I don't think Qatar is uh, going to, uh, to agree to this. And, and all, also the legitimacy of its leadership will not allow this to happen. So I think that is one important thing we always have to remember. So the economic cost, yes, is going to be there and it's going to be enormous, not only for Qatar, but, only for, uh, but also for the other uh, uh, GCC states and the whole region. And unfortunately, this is, comes at a time when the economic situation uh, across the whole region is in a bad shape. Now, Qatar, as um, uh, Professor Noniman just mentioned, has shown extreme resilience to this. And my opinion is that they have done this um, and they have um, learned from the 2013-2014 crisis. Um, and their, their planners must have gone and, and asked the question, so what if these things were going to happen if, uh, in 2013-2014, if the boycott was implemented, and well, even if there was an invasion, et cetera, et cetera. So they have already had plans. Some of them were executed, as Kurt has mentioned, you know, the airport, the, the port, uh, et cetera, in terms of infrastructure, but also global network and sports diplo diplomacy, cultural diplomacy, et cetera. So they have already built a lot of resilience. Um, and this really has shaken and surprised the other countries, which uh, they expected um, that Qatar would um, capitulate uh, very quickly. And this is why they escalated so quickly, expecting that this is going to happen. And they are shocked and they don't know what to do now. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing is Qatar has followed a high moral ground in terms of this crisis, in terms of how to deal with the people from, um, uh, from the, uh, the three countries, or even the four countries, um, um, in, in a way that it is human and giving them all the, uh, the rights, etc. How to, uh, if you look at the media, um, you will see that there is, um, you know, there, you're, t you're talking about four countries, media attacking one small country, but yet, the, per, the country that is winning the streets and the hearts and the minds of the people is Qatar because it's following a very high moral ground, ethical uh, way of explaining their, uh, their cause. They're not playing, as the others are saying, you know, playing a victim. 
they are actually explaining the situation as it is and um, trying to avoid all kinds of you know, nasty things that the other side of the media, uh, the other side is using in its media and social media. And, and this is, reflects on the number of countries that actually supported the boycott. Despite all the efforts and the uh, pressure from those countries to support uh, the boycott, there are only very few handful, small countries that actually supported it. And I think in terms of the public opinion, not only in the GCC, but also in the Arab world, in the Middle East, and globally, I think it's uh, Qatar is winning uh, okay. this battle. Perfect, thanks. Very quick question and a quick response, if I may. You alluded to uh, the possibility that new regional alignments uh, might develop. Do you see a future for the GCC? Or as Abdullah mentioned, do you think it's going to be a forum for drinking sweet tea and not much more substantive action? Well, as, as a result of the crisis, we do realize that the GCC is, has become extremely weak. And uh, uh, Oman is in one direction, uh, Kuwait is in another, uh, not somewhere in between, and then you have Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and the United Arab Emirates. So the GCC is already split, divided, weak, and doesn't have a mechanism for conflict resolution, and has not evolved because it never really gave a voice to people and populations, and it stayed elitist and within a very small margin of what elitism is, with just kings and, and very few. So it's, it, it didn't, it wasn't able to go beyond, uh, couldn't even do the... Uh, uh, Central Bank couldn't do much, only the identity card and then lots of security cooperation. And now we see where we ended up. So my answer to this, is there a future for the GCC? The only future for the GCC if there is a reform plan, and a reform plan is going to require participatory approaches to populations. And uh, so far, this is not in the making. So again, I see new axes in the region. I see Qatar, Turkey. Europe, other countries, Oman, trade routes are going to change and shift. Uh, the, the trade route also with, with Iran is going to take a certain direction. So this changes, geopolitical, strategic changes in the GCC and among its states and in the region. And that will uh, shape uh, new reality. I want to ask one last question from the panel, uh, either, either of you or all of you. Uh, please feel free to answer. Why does this keep happening to Qatar? What is it about Qatar that makes these leaders in Riyadh, Abu Dhabi, Bahrain, in Manama, so deeply suspicious of Qatar? And one cannot help but to think of the uh, old maxim, if there's smoke, there's got to be fire. Well, why does this keep happening? Maybe I can pick up on, um, on where I started. <clears throat> it's a combination, of course, of longer term uh, trends and some individual policy choices on both sides. The longer term trends is, I, I think, I generally believe that is, is a question of Qatar being a late developer in this region. It was the smallest, least populous, poorest, and the latest developer. And it was traditionally under the, uh, the skirts of Saudi Arabia. It just it was. There were a few exceptions, but by and large, it didn't do very much in regional politics, let alone international politics. So that changed dramatically um, from the, well, as Qatar began to develop, then, particularly from the uh, early 90s, and of course, especially with the, uh, the um, assumption of power by Sheikh uh, Hamad in 95. So there was this, this that clash between the the role conception that the other leaders had, particularly Saudi leadership, about its role, its leading role, its hegemonic role in this region. And against that, especially this little latecomer suddenly wanting to, 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 to stride uh, across the stage. That, of course, has been combined with person, personality and choices on the part of the Qatar leadership. They did want to make themselves known globally, and they did adopt a number of policies a, to hedge against precisely the kind of situation they're now uh, suffering, 
um, you know, get, bring in the Americans, develop and, and, and multiply your international relationships, economically as well as in, in terms of soft power and diplomatically. Um, and they pursued a number of specific policies, particularly once the Arab Spring happened. There was, a, there was an opportunity. The leadership saw this as an opportunity. They saw the Arab world as ineluctably changing. Um, various strands of political Islam, they th clearly thought, thought, were going to play some significant role in this. So the only pragmatic solution in that view seems to have been, well, get ahead of the curve, deal with those people, be pragmatic about this. All of that were policy choices that went against the, the persuasions of the, of the Saudi leadership. And then as uh, Saudi Arabia, of course, is recognized as the hegemon, or the would-be hegemon, the big guy in this neighborhood, but Abu Dhabi, the leadership in Abu Dhabi clearly saw themselves as the number two, as deserving to be the number two. So when the competition with Qatar comes in, that's where it really rises, Mohammed bin Zayed and, and his brothers. Thank you. Abdullah, any, anything you want to add? Yep, um, if I may. Um, I, I think uh, I always ask myself this question, why Qatar and why now? <laughs> Um, and I think this is a very important question. And, and as uh, also Gerd has alluded to, it's because Qatar has always been viewed by Saudi Arabia as uh, an extension of the Saudi sphere of influence. And, um, and they could not cont uh, countenance that Qatar is now a new uh, country uh, that has developed um, economic wealth and it uh, wants to find its space and it's sandwich between two large countries, basically Iran on one hand, Saudi Arabia on the other, and it has to protect itself by hedging uh, against everybody and having good relationship with everybody. This is not something that maybe the leadership in Saudi can understand. Why this small country is doing what it's uh, doing? It's doing so because it had to, because it really lives in a, in a, in a tough neighborhood. Uh, and this neighborhood, as I said, uh, mostly, and in the GCC and also beyond the GCC, we are still ruled by this middle age mentality. And if they don't do that, they're not gonna survive in this, uh, in this region. So Qatar is doing this. Of course, they sided with the, uh, with the uh, uh, Arab Spring uh, and they want to be in the right side of history. And that is not something that the, the, uh, you know, the status quo powers in the region wanted to see that. Um, it's been by Qatar being voice for us because of you know, the media that they have and the um, Al Jazeera, etc. But also the competition they, they present you know, into the United Arab Emirates, into economic development and so on. So they, and also because it's, it's actually a vulnerable state. It's a small state. Um, it's easy to boycott. It's easy to, uh, to put pressure on. You, there are other countries in the region that are playing this role in a different way. Kuwait is also playing this role, having good relationship with Iran, Saudi Arabia, uh, etc. It has learned its lesson uh, before, so it's kind of slowed down in, in, in its role. Oman is also playing it, uh, a certain role uh, within the, the GCC. But Qatar, but that's, these countries are a little bit more difficult to, to boycott and to, uh, and to control. Qatar, because of small size, location, population, uh, and, and because of its role, it becomes an easy target for bullying. Thank you. Shafi? Well, I think that uh, most of the important points have been uh, mentioned, and I will only maybe put it in the context of the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring of 2011 gave a voice to the populations of the region. And then there was a counter-revolution. And uh, the counter-revolution was set to try to eliminate, destroy, get out of the way uh, everybody that supported the Arab rebellions. And uh, uh, in a way, uh, Qatar had a certain position within that context. And uh, Adding to that is the tensions that are spread in the region. Uh, the Yemen war. I mean, when the Yemen war started, I felt it's going to bring us more tensions across. Uh, it reminded me with how Saddam Hussein started the Iraq-Iran war. Mm -hmm. Eight years into the Iraq-Iran war, he lost a lot of money. He looked around, he saw Kuwait. 
a little bit vibrant, uh, semi-democratic, able to express itself, he put his hand on Kuwait. So, in a non-democratic region, you expect politics to be sudden shifts, sudden emergency crisis all the time. You sleep on one news, you wake up on another news. Uh, it doesn't mean you're not safe. I'm not scaring you. <laughs> but it is the case until we have institutions that can balance. I mean, if we leave it to President Trump, he would have occupied half of the world. <laughs> but luckily, there are all these institutions in the US that the Americans have worked so hard to build that will put restraint on his decisions in our part of the world, there is no restraint. You wake up, you dream a dream, you go, you implement it the second day. Who can tell you no? Everybody will go along with you from among those who are around you. And, and that's part of the way the Arab world. So I think what this crisis is doing in many ways, uh, this whole blockade against Qatar, it's, it's really uh, creating a serious attrition to the legitimacy the political legitimacy of everyone involved in it. Thank you. C could you just end by, so uh, in your explanation of why this keeps happening, what I didn't hear was any mention of the accusation of support, Qatar's support for terrorism. Could you address that, particularly by the uh, United Arab Emirates, in terms of uh, shelter to some specific individuals that Qatar has provided? Sure. I mean, it's clearly there are a number, there's a long history of, well, there, there are several levels in this. On the one hand, there is what they've said, they, you know, they, they accuse Qatar of being supporters of terrorism because they have links with Hamas and with the Taliban and, and with the Muslim Brotherhood. Well, then it all depends on who, who you define as terrorists. And on those ones, let's quickly park that. I only need to quote um, uh, the former director of the, of the CIA and General... Um, Petraeus, who said, look, people, let's remember that this was done in consultation with the US and in large part at the request of the US because we want these interlocutors. And just a day or so ago, uh, Shlomo Brum, um, former ge Israeli general, made that very same point. So if we put that aside, although that's a large part of the propaganda you hear in the media, there are a number of specific individuals. And, there are clear, and this has been the case for a number of years who have been involved, clearly, in funneling uh, funds, channeling funds to a number of groups that, from, from my point of view, from the US point of view, from many people's point of view, would be undesirable, including radical Islamists and violent jihadists. Um, that's been a subject of discussion for a, several years between the US, both at the embassy here and more generally with, with, with DC, and the leadership here. It's been difficult, but it has moved forward. And so you, you, you do actually get um, results in terms of this new agreement between Qatar and the United States that further controls will be implemented. In fact, Qatar was one of the first Gulf states to put a number of uh, legal constraints in place. Execution has been um, haphazard, has not been 100%, but that's precisely what they're now focusing on. So, yes, there are issues about individuals. It's always been recognized, it's caused difficulties with the US, but for the US decision makers, it's clearly always been the case that that was an irritant. It was not something that was gonna change the balance of power against terrorists, and it was certainly not outweighing the huge strategic value that Qatar had for the US. Perfect, thank you. Shafir, I see you took some notes. Yeah. Very quickly, you want to address the question? Well, very well, quickly. Well, so very we quickly. I mean, I mean, within the demands, there was terrorism. But the definition of terrorism uh, could vary. I mean, you could, I mean, like the Muslim Brothers. There is no, nothing terroristic about the Muslim Brothers. They are a non-violent political group operating all over the Arab world. They are part of the government of Morocco. I just came from Morocco. It's an open country, and it has a government that is led by the Muslim Brothers. So, so just giving this accusation of terrorism on uh, human rights activists, um, anybody in the opposition, uh, within the 13 demands, there is all of uh, the, I mean, closing a, a Jazeera, 
it is, it, this is very medieval, right? I mean, I would have to agree on that this is very medieval. It's like saying, we have to close France 24. It's too much critical of certain. We have to close the BBC. It's too critical of other countries. Of, uh, I mean, it's, uh, it, it doesn't work this way. And the world has changed. And it seems that these demands, when you look at them, you realize they are totally outdated from the beginning, from the first uh, uh, one. Uh, uh, that you don't uh, naturalize citizens uh, from the four countries uh, or three countries, wherever, who are stripped of their citizenship. I mean, why? I mean, you prefer Canada to naturalize them and USA and Australia. And why? I mean, everybody, I mean, is it, they'll be definitely able to say more if they go to Canada and Australia. Actually, it's better to be in Qatar. There'll be some limitations. Uh, uh, you want Hamas not to have any leader in Qatar? Why? You prefer they go to Iran? They will, uh, they will, I mean, then you're bringing Sunnis and Shias on one cause. And who said Hamas is terroristic? I mean, this is, this is strange. Hamas has never, despite all the different points of views about Hamas, Hamas has never done any military operation outside the territory of occupation and Palestine. Never. It has focused on the land of Palestine, full stop. Like the South Africans, whenever they did. Even if you are critical of violence, but they have done it in their own land because they have been subjugated to blockade and siege and violence. So to come and say Hamas is terrorist, while they have never done anything close to anything similar to what ISIS and Qaeda and all of the others uh, do. It's not an international terroristic organization to have a position against it. So, Looking at these demands, they're too out of date, too limiting, uh, uh, and in the end of the day, they do not speak to any serious issue. And we see uh, uh, the foreign minister of the US, Tillerson, uh, uh, making a, a, an agreement on terrorism with the foreign minister of Qatar, and yet the blockade continued. So I thought maybe when they sign this, the blockade will go, since terrorism was the issue. And then there was all this list of names. I mean, nobody heard of them in the United Nations. Nobody heard of them in any international terrorist uh, list. So we can make up lists and we can make up accusations, but that does not mean people do not read and see and understand. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's open the floor to some questions. Uh, yes. Uh, Professor Abu <laughs> I have two questions very quickly about where is the Egyptian factor in this discussion about the GCC fragmentation? And secondly, about the GCC, if mediations were to uh, succeed, how can Qatar deal with a question of trust? How could they ensure that something of the sort is not going to, be, uh, to happen again? Thank Perfect. you. Perfect. Thank you. The question is uh, for Professor Shafiq. It is well known that the Kuwaiti media is the most liberal in the Arab world. And obviously this is to be praised, lauded, and indeed encouraged. However, pundits would observe that uh, the Kuwaiti media reflecting obviously the opinion of the Kuwaiti government on many issues, including the current Gulf crisis, is really biased towards the blockading alliance when it comes to this crisis and the issues involved, which would compromise the status of Kuwait as a mediator. So the question remains, what is your opinion your candid and voracious opinion on this. Perfect, thank you. Thank you so much. How united is the United Arab Emirates behind Abu Dhabi's leadership? Perfect, thank you. And one more question before we take another round. Uh, front row, um, Dean Delal. Thank you for, uh, for uh, the you know, very enlightening panel. I, if I'm not mistaken, I hear two different points of view on the origins of the, of the current crisis. And, uh, and I would like you to address the implications for imagining a resolution of the crisis based on how you view the, the origin. On the one hand, 
some of you seem to think that the list of demands was a list which is cooked so that it's not possible to accept it. On the other hand, there is this view, there is a view, there seems to be a view that initially the, the expectation was that there would be immediate capitulation and then it didn't happen and then the crisis sort of unfolded in a different direction. These are two different points of view. And depending on which one you take, then the ability to imagine a resolution would be different. So could you care to comment? Yes. Um, gentlemen? Um, well, I, I did, I wrote my, my, my first master dissertation 30 years ago on GCC, on Gulf integration, and it came out a month after the GCC was created. But Abdullah wrote a book about it, so I'm going to leave that to him. Um, um, but I'd, I'd say that yes, the, the, the trust, I, I, li I live in Qatar, you know, but I am not a Qatari, but nevertheless, I cannot imagine that the trust um, in the GCC or indeed in the leading players, the leadership of Abu Dhabi and, and uh, Saudi Arabia can be restored. It can ultimately be managed, it can become a, uh, a, a modus vivendi, but not much beyond that. Qatar will simply be reinforced in the suspicions it always had of this organization and Saudi uh, views of its own role in this region, um, which is why the difference, in the, the new foreign policy um, started back in the mid-1990s. Mid on Egypt, I think Egypt's got a different uh, view on that. I mean, Egypt's uh, investment in this whole conflict is um, about the Muslim Brotherhood and, and countering the Arab Spring. They saw allies in the, Sa the Saudis and, and uh, Abu Dhabi. And of course, at the same time, they needed Saudi and Abu Dhabi money. Right? And that's really it. I mean, um, but it's interesting that Egypt is slightly different also because Egypt's also reliant on, um, on, on well, Qatar, amongst other places, for labor, work opportunity for a lot of their, their workers and so on. So they've, and and they're, they're dependent also on Qatari gas. So it's a slightly different, uh, different rationale. Um, the, th the thing about the UAE, I'd very much like to address that because <clears throat> I hinted at it briefly at the beginning. I think it's crucial when people say, you know, when, when the media sometimes portray this as the GCC versus Qatar, it's clearly not true. It's three GCC countries. Bahrain, on the one hand, doesn't really matter too much because it's become a vassal of, of the Saudis. And, but if, on the other hand, they have a particular reason to be very afraid of, very worried, at least the, the, the leadership of, Qatar, of Bahrain, very worried about Iran and, and, and their own Shia population. But it's really about Saudi Arabia and the UAE. In the UAE, you're absolutely right, this is not something that is united about the UAE, in, in this case, of the policy of this case. It's really very much the leadership of Abu Dhabi, this new, fa fairly you know, middle-aged now, uh, leadership of Abu Dhabi, no longer uh, following the, line, the kind of line of pattern of policy that Sheikh Zayed might have followed in the past. And, and they see the, 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 the world and their region through a very strongly security focus or security colored prism. They, I should really say, Mohammed bin Zayed and, and a couple of his brothers. Of course, what's happened is that, so on the one hand, you have a change in leadership that's become much more confident in Abu Dhabi, and at the same time, you've had the financial crisis which made Dubai subservient to Abu Dhabi. I have not the slightest doubt that the Al Maktoum of Dubai think this is a terrible situation. I would have never gone down this route. And the same is true for a number of other uh, leading figures in, in the UAE. But they haven't got the leverage to do that. Final comment. In Saudi Arabia, there was also, I would say, not a united view on this. I mean, there were other voices. And one of the differences, I think, is what may slight variation on Abdullah's viewpoint, I think, on this, that it's in Saudi Arabia, even though you might have, you have a you know, ruling family and the king is, is, is severe, seriously powerful and can make decisions and so on, nevertheless, the Saudi system always had a bit of a tradition of consensus building and fairly slow decision making as a result. So there were always different voices that, were, that had a chance to be heard before decisions were made. That seems to have vanished. These other voices seem to have been really put aside, locked away, put under house arrest. One of the most significant moments was when Mohammed bin Nayef was 
basically taken out of circulation. Um, now he's one example, whatever else one might think of some of his views um, and policies, who was, he was a thoughtful person who looked at evidence and would bounce things off other people. So I think Saudi Arabia was not united on this, still is not united on this, but it just so happened that just like in the UAE, the decision-making structures have changed. And that's been a contributing factor to the whole situation. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, the Kuwaiti media. Kuwaiti media, uh, well, never judge a situation from the media. <laughs> In fact, you read the Saudi media and we all see what is happening. I would say 90% of the Saudis do not approve of the blockade. Every Saudi I have encountered has not been happy about what was going on. So there is a disconnect. So even in Kuwait, there is a disconnect. The media tends to also, the official media, the newspapers, to reflect the owners more than the actual editorial board or editorial policy. And the editorial board and policy is a reflection of who owns the newspaper. So if commercial interests own a newspaper, and they have commercial interests all over around in the GCC, make sure it's going to be in a certain direction. It's not this free media in that context. So I see limitations to our media, and if I want to see a mirror, I will see it more in the social media, but also keep in mind embassies are in the business of uh, going to bringing young men and women who speak on the social media to court. And we have cases in Kuwait. I mean, the interesting fact is that ambassadors in the US, Arab ambassadors, are always in the business of responding positively to the New York Times on a negative auditorial about their particular country. Unfortunately, in the Arab world, they don't have to do that. They just take you to court and throw you in jail. Uh, on statements like insulting the country or uh, putting down its uh, giant economy or uh, saying statements of a certain nature. So we, we, we struggle. I mean, and Kuwaitis who are trying to express freely struggle within that context. After all, Kuwait is a small country and there are all these influences and these regional uh, shifts. However, I think the mediation of Sheikh Sabah, the Emir of Kuwait, has been very genuine, very accurate, very deep, very serious. Um, and uh, despite all the issues of the region, has come up to the moment, to the point where going to the White House and saying that there was a military option and we were able to help uh, prevent it. And that the media is getting very low recently. And that to be able uh, to, to make statements like when he was, the Emir of Kuwait, in particularly in Riyadh during the Trump summit with the Arab uh, uh, GCC countries in May, he didn't sense that there was any problem whatsoever. Everything was good. So that's also telling about this whole situation. I wanted to comment on the others, if you allow me. Go ahead. Well, and uh, if you don't, I'm also... No, okay. no, no, go yeah. ahead. Okay. And then we want to uh, turn it over to the uh, troublesome... Uh, yes. <laughs> Abdullah uh, so, so going to the, the other questions, Egypt, is an is a important uh, state, is an important country. It had a rebellion, a revolution. It had a, an elected government. Then there was a coup and a counter-revolution, and the Gulf got involved in one direction or the other. So I think there is an Egyptian side to this entire situation. However, whatever we say, there is a new president, President Morsi, but he also leads his country, uh, not pre President uh, Sisi, who, who leads his country while the former president and all the former cabinet plus 60,000 are in jail. So to tell me that Egypt can fly without addressing this issue is totally a contradiction in terms. And to blame Qatar for the situation in Egypt is also a contradiction in terms. 
unless Egypt is able to come to a serious compromise within, release people from jail, come to a dialogue, create a, some sort of a, a venue for uh, opening up the entire system, uh, Egypt will continue from one crisis to the other, from one shift to the other, and the economy will only do worse and worse. And, and so that's, that's corner, that's an issue here, why Egypt is part of the blockade and why the Egyptian situation is so complex and at the same time needs a resolution and there has not been a resolution and human rights is suffering uh, in Egypt. And then the whole question on uh, the, uh, the two views and uh, etc. I think the trust, yes, has been broken. I mean, 14 was important, but now this year it broke the trust. It doesn't mean that things could improve in terms of human interactions, trips, visits, maybe the borders. But I, I think there is something deeper that will remain. And that I think there is a train that has left the station. You're not going to go back on all this investment in Oman. Qatar is, is, is already invested. It's, it's keep, so the longer the crisis, the more these are serious. Uh, you, you, Qatar is not going to uh, tell the Turkish base, uh, the crisis is over, goodbye. They're going to tell the Turkish base, the crisis is over, please bring more Turks. <laughs> and it's going to improve relations with so many European powers to guarantee a solid situation, envisioning another adventure, potentially, to avert any invention. So then, yes, you can, life could go on, but I think there's going to be a lot, and that's so this relation with the Turks, this neutrality with the Iranians, this situation with Europe, this talk at the international level and in the regional level and the relation with Kuwait, among others, all of that will continue at a certain level politically in this new axis in the region. So we're going to live with an axis of power structures for, for, for a long time, and then you see it as part, who knows, then there could be... Uh, Stage two Arab uh, Spring, those who don't like the Arab Spring, stage two, 2022 or 2023. Let's hope after the football games. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then so, so then all these axes will come into operation in different levels and ways. There is nothing, nothing you see today in the region. As you take a picture and a photo of the leaders and the rulers and the governments and the structures and the civil wars. Six years from now, you could have a totally different picture. Totally different picture. That's not the case in more stable economies and democracies. This is the case in our part of the world. So you are in a very interesting place, in a place where you learn everyday new things. High risk, but high return. Excellent. <laughs> Uh, you called me, uh, labeled me troublesome, so I will, <laughs> I will try and live up to that. Um, <laughs> Please do. Yeah. Yes, excellent. Um, is Qatar an innocent country? Why are they doing this against Qatar? I don't think Qatar is an innocent country. But show me a country that is not innocent. Mm -hmm. All countries in the world have vested interests, state interests that they have to follow, and a perception of what their region and their policies, and they have to follow. Sometimes they make mistakes. But do these mistakes um, lead up or cause what has happened? I think that is over-exaggerated. Qatar is supporting terrorism. The irony about this is that, you know, this is one of the accusation about Qatar that is supporting terrorism. But look who is accusing Qatar. Uh, it doesn't make any sense uh, uh, to me that you know that you can accuse Qatar of supporting terrorism, and of course, we've my colleagues have already spoken about how do you define terrorists and how's uh, Qatar reception uh, perception of you know supporting uh, different organizations. Have they made mistakes? I would say yes, like any other uh, country had had made mistakes. Um, is there going to be any trust in the GCC? Well, the GCC, um, I may also have forgotten a number of questions, but the GCC is supposed to be a security community. And a security community means that, you know, the whole idea of war or threat 
is completely out of question. So you work together and you're secure in one region. That has, uh, and the revelation that we've heard also from the Emir of Kuwait in Washington um, has showed us that you know, there was a military plan, uh, a threat against, uh, against Qatar. So where is this whole idea of a security community? And if the security community is not there, if the economic um, agreement that these leaders have signed, they don't uh, uphold, how can you trust the GCC? And if the GCC is so itself, the administration is so absent from the whole crisis and they can't even see, uh, say a word, how can you trust the institutions of the GCC? Not only within the GCC, but do you know that the GCC, I'm sure many of you do know, is negotiating a number of strategic relationship with the rest of the world, with the United States, with Europe, with China, with Turkey, and so on. And how can you present yourself now as a GCC to all these strategic partners and say we are a region that we want to develop, we want to create strategic relationship. How do other people look at you and trust you? So the trust is not being lost domestically, but it's also lost internationally uh, uh, of the GCC. Believe it or not, the ambassador for the GCC now in Brussels is a Qatari. <laughs> he can't talk to the rest of uh, other GCC uh, uh, nationals. It's a joke. The whole thing is unfortunately a joke. Um, and I would also add something we uh, maybe we have uh, not mentioned much. I think we should not neglect domestic politics within these states. And what's happening in Saudi Arabia, um, Gert has mentioned it, you mentioned uh, uh, some, some of that uh, uh, issues. What domestic politics play a very important role. Is, and you know, we are really seeing a new leadership uh, developing here. And you wonder sometimes, I do wonder, whether this is being created as a deflection um, and, and as an opportunity for the changes that are going to happen in these, uh, in these countries. Is the, EU, uh, the UAE united? No, they were not united. But I would say that recently there has been a lot of pressure on the other uh, UAE uh, Emirates, and uh, there seems to be some um, agreement uh, on this because of the pressure that comes from uh, uh, Abu Dhabi. Is there a solution to this? And how does the solution relate to the uh, causes? I think the causes are flawed initially, and the, uh, and, the, uh, and the solution is going to be something that we don't expect. I don't think you can really rationally uh, analytically explain this in, in a way that fits in with uh, rationality and, 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 uh, uh, and you know, state uh, behavior. Uh, this is totally beyond every expectation and I think the, the, the solution is going to be totally unexpected and uh, we have a, a system here in the Gulf that we call it, you know, kissing the noses and uh, we will see that, uh, you know, at one point the leadership, uh, the leaders will be kissing their noses and the whole problem will be out, but the, the underlying problems will continue to stay because they continue uh, to drive some of these smaller states' policies. They don't feel secure within this region. Perfect, thank you. Let me take some more questions. The gentleman from the second row in the back, yes. So as this uh, crisis is moving from the realm of resolution into the um, realm of management, and it's expected that it will last for a very long time, could it then be um, an enabler for change in the region, for basically for a Gulf Spring? Perfect. Okay, excellent. Gulf Thank you. Uh, could, the, uh, uh, could the crisis be an enabler for change, a Gulf Spring? Mm -hmm. The gentleman in the blue shirt here in the third row. Thank you all very much for uh, the talk. 
Uh, my question concerns the energy factor, if there is one, and if so, what it is in, the, uh, in this Gulf crisis, specifically the transportation of natural gas between Gulf countries and its role in certain critical state industries. Hi, Professor Kamrava, big fan. Um, Thank I just you. <laughs> Dean, <laughs> did you hear that? <laughs> Great, Professor. Say um, that again. <laughs> <laughs> amazing, Professor. But I think I just wanted to end this conversation with a very important question, I think, just addressing the orange elephant in the room. I wanted to talk about the role that Trump is playing in this crisis. Orange <laughs> <laughs> elephant in the room. Trump's role. Uh, huh? What? Trump's role. Uh, oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, the, the, the question question? had to do with the orange elephant in the room, the role of Donald Trump. Please, yes, go ahead. Okay. Absolutely. So, uh, Gulf Spring, we're always in a spring. <laughs> After all, what happened in 2011 has not stopped. And every power that has tried and worked hard to bring it back to where it happened and existed before 2011 has failed and will fail. The Arab world has changed and the new generations are multiplying and the requirements of political systems uh, will not keep up with this new generation. So change is in motion, whether we see it or it is underpinning, it is there. And therefore, I see spring all the time happening, dormant and not dormant. So you will see it now, tomorrow, after tomorrow. It is in the region and the Gulf is part of the region. However, I see that this crisis has brought the Arab world's problems and issues and conflict to the Gulf. I thought in the beginning that the Gulf can isolate itself from the rest of the region. We have all these wars around, that, but now it is part. So this is also telling us that there's something wrong structurally that produces a crisis. And only by addressing the root causes of these structural problems can we find ways that will allow us to have a safer life and uh, less crisis-ridden. So uh, that's my answer to the spring. And then regarding the Trump. Uh, yes, he is present. I, I have to admit, I mean, even in the crisis, uh, uh, he, he, his tweets were part of the crisis, part of the blockhead as well. And then he wakes up sometimes and he makes a tweet that uh, makes him uh, look at he's part of the blockhead. And that, that's what happened. So he did escalate. Luckily, America is about institutions. It's about from Congress all the way to even institutions of government and that people have a certain level of commitment to their uh, society and uh, representation. And that made uh, the other part of America show a different face and uh, uh, put limits to what uh, Trumpism is able uh, to do. So I think without Trump, maybe this crisis would not have erupted. Okay. Yes, with Obama, it couldn't have erupted. He would have been tough on it. But with Trump, there was an opportunity and there was a lot of finances going on that happened when you all saw the Riyadh conference. So I think that encouraged, was an enabler to the crisis, uh, but I think that also has reached its mm -hmm. ceiling. Perfect, thank you. Uh, the role of the energy uh, question is very important. Could you address that, Abdul? Yeah, I just wanted uh, to say that uh, Shafiq had also answered to why, why now? Why Qatar and why now? I think that meeting in Riyadh has something to do to with do it. it. I think the, uh, the, the, the messages that came from President Trump may have been misread and misperceived uh, by the other GCC say that they can continue and do what they wanted to do. But it seems that now the whole US administration um, has and you know the, 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 the system, the American system, that's based on institutional uh, decision making, etc., has now converged on um, trying to find a solution to uh, to the problem because the crisis 
does affect U.S. strategy, U.S. policy in the region, and it's to the U.S. interest to uh, help with it. And I think we're going to see a lot of U.S. involvement uh, in this. Um, there was another question I wanted to answer to before uh, that, but I forgot what it was. Uh, there was the, the crisis and spring. Trump and the, the, the spring. Uh, the spring. The spring. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think the spring is going to, uh, it's there. Uh, we cannot deny it. Uh, it's gonna, we're going to see ups and downs. Uh, but I think you cannot continue uh, to ruling this region with this political system that we have uh, and the way that we have. Uh, and when you, know, when you have universities like this, when you have institutions, academic institutions, that people are learning, there are a better way of learning, so we're going, uh, of, of governance. So I think in the future we're going to see a much more uh, develop not necessarily a revolution, but an evolution of the political system. I think the uh, the gas uh, issue has been completely out of this conflict. Um, Qatar continued uh, to uh, uh, support its uh, commitment to the rest of the GCCC, and I don't think it will uh, it will stop that. Um, I believe that Qatar, you know, always try to play this high moral ground. They have agreements with the United Arab Emirates, the Dolphin Pipeline, which goes to Oman as well, and Oman is a beneficiary, so they don't want, and Oman is, has good relationship with Qatar, so they don't want to harm Oman as well. And I don't think they would uh, cut off the, uh, uh, the, the gas uh, pipeline or the gas supply to, uh, to the United Arab Emirates. Um, and I think in the future, you know, we're going to see much more, um, much more uh, gas uh, uh, grid between uh, the Gulf states, uh, because I believe that is where um, not only uh, we, you, know, you share resources within the region. Despite all these problems and so on, um, uh, economics has its own rationality, and uh, and you know, uh, Qatar does not want just to uh, live on one source, and that is the LNG. So they also want to have pipelines uh, to the region, and they don't want to lose their name and reputation of you know, uh, not supporting their commitments to this. Thank you. Gerd, you get the last word for the night. Mm -hmm. They say never miss a good opportunity in a big crisis. And we're facing a crisis that we haven't seen before. If there were one or two opportunities that you would highlight in this crisis, what would those opportunities be? I think there are two or in two areas, and they're linked to what we've just has just been said. One is in economics. Um, Qatar has was prepared to, and is now developing um, its its as a multiplicity of complementary um, networks, economic networks, and at the same time, domestically, is trying to figure out what what can be produced here and how things can be done more efficiently and, and is, is further building up um, sort of resilience to such uh, potential such situations that have spin-off effects. So in, in those sorts of areas, something is already, is already happening and that's going to continue. That's going to remain, as Shafiq was saying earlier, even after this crisis is, uh, is, is managed, been managed down. But another area, we've already seen some, something happening, and it's in, it's in, in the societal, political kind of uh, realm. A little bit, maybe a little bit of a spring, as, as you were referring to. And I, when I'm seeing um, some reform um, legislation coming through, whether it's on migrant labor, or on citizenship rules, or, or um, uh, particular benefits that long-term residents of this country can have even if they're not citizens. Those are a few examples in important areas that link both to considerations of long developing a long-term sustainable economy and to debates about this that have been going on here in Qatar and among leadership, members of the broader leadership uh, for quite some time. And they were, they were seemed a little bit too timid to push these things through, and now there's an opportunity. And it's, it wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if more such things happen in the, in the near and medium term future. Secondly, on the, or 
as a, another part of that second wing of uh, the, this spring, let's say. Is, I've been, it's been really striking to see, I don't have to tell anybody this in this room, how the population of Qatar, especially the citizens, but also others, have really come out spontaneously and organized. You look at you know, the posters, there's now one in our own atrium, a big billboard of, of uh, uh, the, the Anir, and but also on social media. And the, in a sense, it sort of seems to have given life blood to a bottoms-up approach of a society that's beginning to self-organize in ways that really wasn't happening uh, for, for some decades. Can I just link that to Saudi Arabia? Uh, the, the wide, Saudi Arabia, after all, is the biggest country in the Gulf. I was, one of the reasons I was so sad, I've been so sad about what's been happening there, not just its foreign policy, but the crackdown that's been happening the last few weeks and months, is that I spend quite a lot of time in Saudi Arabia and studying Saudi Arabia, have lots and lots of Saudi friends, and we've worked with many people there officially and academically. And over the last, last year, I was actually really optimistic about Saudi Arabia. Because on the one hand, you had, of course, the reforms, very difficult economic reforms, over-ambitious and over-optimistic, but nevertheless, recognizing some of the problems, potentially breaking something open. But at the same time, what I noticed was amongst young people in general, there was a real debate going on. People were much more open than they'd ever been before. All sorts of taboo subjects were being discussed in taxis, in lecture theaters, on the streets, in cafes, even in, in the media. So I was very optimistic. I, there was some kind of effervescent you know, ferment going on, as you were, you were saying. I don't think, like you, that it can be locked up again. This is there. But the sadness is it might have to go through a long period of, of su suppression and violence and so Before on. It, so the question is, and, and that links to the sort of possible resolution of the Qatar crisis in the future, where these tensions in Saudi Arabia in particular, look at the consequences of the, of the Yemen war, look at the difficulties that are going to present themselves in economic reform, and you look at this ferment that's being that has the lid put on it, but keeps bubbling. You put all that together, I think you might see something inside Arabia of the medium term, and that might in turn influence decisions about who's going to rule Saudi Arabia and who's going to make decisions on things like Qatar. Many thanks. We have run way over our allocated time. Please join me in thanking our speakers for very insightful discussion. Thank you. My sincere thanks. Thank you. Thank you.